Well, good morning, and welcome to worship this morning at First Baptist Church of Fort Payne. It is a, is a joy to see you all here, so, so welcome in. Uh, my name is Marshall. I'm the pastor here. If we haven't met, I would, I would love to meet you. Uh, and of course, this morning, let me be, if not the first, one of the first to welcome you here if you are a guest or visiting with us in some capacity this morning. Um, so uh, just a little bit of information right up front. Uh, if you are a guest, we do have a guest information card located in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, it's just an opportunity for us to connect with you better, so you could fill that out and drop that in your offering plate, or you'll see in the pew rack as well, there's a QR code you can scan to fill that out digitally as well. Uh, now, we also have, during the middle of the service, children leave for Children's Church, uh, and so you'll see that's a pretty obvious departure in the middle of service there. They meet on the second floor. Uh, if, if you're a parent new or visiting, uh, there's also name tags in the pew racks as well. You can fill out part of that. One part goes on the child, one part uh, you keep, and that way you're able to collect them after the service. So look at you. Look around. Balls in the air. You look good. You look good. Uh, and listen, you've made, you've made a great decision to be here this morning, and it may have been a decision this morning where you woke up and you whistled all the way until you got here, and that's, that's a delight. Uh, you couldn't wait. Uh, this morning to be here, it might have been a decision that was a little bit difficult. Maybe you had to wrestle with a toddler. You had to wrestle within yourself, and, and maybe you came in today and it feels a little bit risky to be here, uh, to come to church, but I'm so glad that you're here. Listen, we meet together this morning in the presence of Jesus Christ. We're, we're told in John's gospel that Peter answered Jesus and said something like this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so deep within us, as we gather this morning, we know that what Peter said is true. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. We may convince ourselves that there might be somewhere better to be today, uh, or that we're just doing Jesus a favor by showing up today. But the truth is that no one has the words that Jesus has. Words of deep truth, words of deep comfort, words of hope, words of life that not even death can take away. So good that you're here today. So for all who are weary and need rest, for all who mourn and long for comfort, for all who fail and desire strength, and for all who sin and need a Savior. This church opens wide its doors to you because the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has the words of eternal life, opens wide his arms to you. Welcome to worship this morning. As we begin, if you would join with me in this call to worship from Psalm 67, and I invite you to stand. It'll be on the screen here for you. I'll read the portions in white. If you'll join with me in the portions printed in yellow, and you'll see those there. So let's, let's begin with Psalm 67. Peace be with you. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. Amen. While you're standing, take a moment or two uh, and welcome those around you. Well, good morning as well. As y'all make your way back to your seats, grab one of those songbooks in front of you. 
Hymn number 336, Come Thou Almighty King is our opening selection, or the words will be on the screen. Let's sing together. may be seated, please. Good morning, boys and girls. Over the last several weeks, we have been learning about fruits of the Spirit. Last week, we learned about kindness, and today we are going to learn about goodness. Now, raise your hand if you've ever been told by your parents or your teachers to be good. <laughs> yes, most of us in here have been told by someone in our lives to be good, but what does that look like? On the screen, I have some pictures of things we can do that are good things. Using manners like please and thank you are good things, and so is helping others and being a good friend. But the fruit of the Spirit, goodness, is not just about being good, but doing what is good. Let's look and see what Jesus says about goodness in the Bible. In Luke 18, verse 18, it says, And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. This tells us that only God is truly good. To say that God is good means that he always does what is right. There is nothing bad, evil, or dark about God. He is good all the time. Can you imagine being good all the time? That means never lying, even a little bit, 
It means never saying something mean or taking a cookie without permission. That is hard sometimes. It's impossible to be good on our own. That's why Jesus said only God is good. But Jesus is God. So when we look at Jesus' life, we see the only, only human being who was ever truly good. Jesus was good even when no one was looking. That brings us to a problem. If only God is good, then how can you and I grow in the fruit of goodness? Goodness starts by accepting that God forgave your sin through Jesus' death on the cross. Then it continues as the Holy Spirit works inside you to make you more like Jesus. He helps you practice doing the right thing even when no one is looking. When life is hard and even if your friends turn away because you follow Jesus. No matter what, God is good. God is the source of all goodness. And when we believe in God, he helps us choose what is good and right. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the love and goodness you show us every day. Thank you for giving us Jesus to look at as the perfect example of goodness. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to help us grow in goodness. Help us to practice goodness so we can show others how good you are. Amen. Thank you, Ellie Kate. This morning we, we look at the ways that the Holy Spirit leads us, guides us, speaks to us. We also now are about to enter into a time of prayer where we have the opportunity to confess sin, but be assured then of that pardon. So as we, we think about those things together, uh, we sing next uh, the Michael W. Smith Breathe and then the chorus Breathe on Me immediately following that. Remain seated though as we sing together. <laughs>
So I wanted to take a few moments and spend some time in, in prayer together. It's a time set aside in our service uh, for confession of our sins. It's a time that we confess our need for a Savior, but it just it doesn't stop there, okay? So we're going to confess our sins, but also in this moment, we remind ourselves of God's gracious supply of his mercy. So I've got a, I've got a prayer that will help us to concentrate our hearts in this moment. It's printed on the screen here for you. Would you join with me in this prayer, and then afterward we'll, we'll go into a time of, of silent prayer. Would you pray with me? God, oh God, early in the morning, I cry to you. Help me to pray and to concentrate my thoughts on you. I cannot do this alone. In me there is darkness, but with you there is light. I am lonely, but you do not leave me. I am feeble in heart, but with you there is help. I am restless, but with you there is peace. In me there is bitterness, but with you there is patience. I do not understand your ways, but you know the way for me. Restore me to liberty and enable me to live now that I may answer before you and before men. Lord, whatever this day may bring, your name be praised. Amen. Would you spend a few moments in silent prayer? Lord, we thank you that in Christ there is no condemnation and that we are forgiven and free. Amen. Now hear this assurance from Scripture that we have a merciful God. This is Psalm 103, 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Praise be to God. As we continue our worship together, thinking on that uh, assurance that we have, it is in our times of anxiety and feeling lost and alone, it is the Holy Spirit that will speak that word of peace and assurance, helping us feel satisfied that, that God is with us. Uh, we sing now, Him. Uh, Hymn numbered uh, 621, Satisfied. We'll do a couple of stanzas together. Please stand. Let's sing.
remain standing. So we continue this idea. Uh, this next song entitled simply, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. I've asked my sister Kay uh, to lead out in that. Feel free to sing with her, though. Uh, and then we'll all sing together with her on the second and third stanzas. Holy Spirit, breathe in. standing for just a moment. Our children are dismissed to Children's Church at this time. Uh, adults, if you'll remain standing for just a minute, uh, they'll leave and we'll have our scripture reading. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. 
If you're using the Pew Bible, it can be found on page 1058. Verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up until that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we ask this morning together, how does the Holy Spirit lead us? It's the question we want to tackle this morning. How does the Holy Spirit lead us? Now we've been going through the series uh, over the last several weeks called Beauty and Brawn, thinking about uh, both the comforts of Christ to his church, something beautiful happening here, and also uh, Christ challenges to his church and how Christ, through his love, uh, his profound love for his church, will strengthen us and move us to new strength. And so we've talked about over the past several weeks, we've talked three weeks ago about worship. And worship is something like this. God says to us, come and delight in me. Okay, that's worship. Uh, well, last week we talked about discipleship. Jesus says to us, God says to us, come and learn from me. And today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, which is something like this, come and be filled with God's personal presence. You know, thinking about that, about being filled with God's personal presence, the text says today about that Spirit, it's like water pouring into our souls. The Spirit coming and dwelling with us. It's like water being poured into our souls. It's like water being poured into our souls and creating a spring welling up inside of us, making us a well-watered garden. Think about those words for us and for your life, nourishing new life and growth. It's like water inside of us cutting new paths and new tributaries within us. And then, and then, and then, after water is poured in, we become well watered. This is the work of the Spirit. And then, flowing out from you, out of your heart, it says, will flow rivers of living water. Out. That's descriptive of believers in Jesus receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to look with me for just a moment. And we'll look up close for just a second, then we'll zoom out a little bit today. But to look at, at the passage, if you don't have your Bibles open, open them back up, you know. Or if you have a pew Bible, 1058, I believe, is the page. Let's look at this together. So this text, when Jesus stands on the last and great day of the, of the feast, and he cries out, it begins with a question. Is anybody thirsty? If anyone thirsts, that's the, that's the beginning here. That's the beginning of the deal, of the pouring out of the rivers and the Holy Spirit will be received by thirsty people. Do you see that? If anyone thirsts, come to me. Receive, thirsty people receive the Holy Spirit. The promise is not, as many people think, reserved for the morally elite. The promise is not reserved for people with nice, tidy lives. It's not reserved for people who are already contented in their life, but who just need a little bit of a power boost to level up. Promises for the thirsty. Thirsty people, people who have need, people who feel barren, people feeling the drought and disaster in their souls and praying that God would do a work to reverse their dusty souls. There's no meritocracy here. There's no spiritual nepotism in Jesus' words. Jesus says, come. And if you come, you should expect his best. And so the text begins there, it begins with thirst. Think about this. But it doesn't end with thirst. So it begins asking, are you thirsty? But then it, look, it ends prophetically, really, as Jesus looks ahead in time at the Spirit's work. There's, it, it, it ends with this really prophetic vision of what the Holy Spirit turns our lives into. And that's this. Rivers flowing to serve millions and millions of thirsty sinners and sufferers as we receive from him first. 
Think about the beauty of, in just a few verses, where Jesus takes us. Are you thirsty? Come to me. And then the Holy Spirit will turn your life into rivers flowing to serve his church, you know, his, with his church, with people around the world and over time. Millions and millions of other thirsty sinners and sufferers as we receive from him first. So what do we do with that? That's, that's the journey. What, what do we do with that? Well, I would say my first inclination is just to say yes. Yes, Lord. That's why we came here today. Just say yes, Lord. We want to receive. We want to be led by that Holy Spirit. We want to go with that Holy Spirit. We want to do what he wants and nothing less, right? If that's the journey, that sounds great. Just say yes. Second, if you're wondering what you should do with your life, like what's my purpose, God, what should I be doing with my life? Jesus says this, your life will be turned by the Spirit into rivers of living water. That, this, this phrase is the calling of every Christian. If you're praying through God, what are you calling me to? Rivers of living water flowing out. This is the summary of the church's mission. What are we here for, Lord? Rivers of living water flowing out. And the work we are called to is tied to the giving of the Holy Spirit. Third, I want you to notice something. Okay? So we say yes. We see in this phrase our mission as a church, so we're not really walking around confused, like, what's our purpose in life? Rivers of living water. But I want you to look at this, too. Uh, it's like if you, look at, if you look at the phrasing here, it's not just like cupfuls of water being thrown. Rivers. Not just a, not as a river flowing. Rivers flowing. There's water everywhere. Okay? That's the picture. This is like, you know, or think about it this way. It's like we think, okay, what are we doing as a church? Well, we're not just getting by. Right? We're not just like toughing it out one more day and one more week. We're not just getting by. Rivers of living water. It's like when you go in and there's like a, like a child taking a bath in the bathtub, right? You ever, you ever, you ever encountered this situation? Like, it's, it's this picture of such great joy and great satisfaction in the spirit that it's like that. Everyone gets drenched. That's what happens when a toddler takes a bath. Water everywhere, all the time. And if we think about that, if we think about the joy and the satisfaction we have in Christ through the spirit, like, our role is not to be like me, like the frazzled parent who comes in the room and says, no more baths. I mean, I think we pretty much banned baths in our house. The floor was going to fall through, right? We don't want to end the fun. No, we want to lean into this. There's this, this wonderful quote. It's in, it's in his commentary on Isaiah, uh, so nothing connected with this passage, really, uh, but Ray, Ray Ortland's commentary. It says this, every church should put a notice on its front door. Enter at your own risk. All face-saving moralists take warning. Within these doors, your chilly pride is in danger of melting into exuberant joy. But all sinners depressed with guilt are welcome. Christianity throbs with holy joy. God made it that way. And if we think about these words, come who are thirsty, you'll be turned into... Rivers of living water, they'll flow out of your soul. How, how serious was Jesus about this? Like, you may be tempted to say, that's great. That sounds very poetic. Jesus has this great, pious, flowery, flowery language. And maybe you're like, well, that's, I'm, I'm kind of detached right now in my life from the poetics of a first century rabbi. But if you would, look with me in verse 39. How serious was Jesus about this? I want you to see the reality. Jesus staked his life on it. We're told here that the Spirit would be given to those who believe Jesus. It hadn't been given yet, but it would be given after Jesus was glorified. And in the Gospel of John, that language glorified always takes us to the cross. 
where Jesus is lifted up on the cross, Jesus was not a poet. He's a savior who would give his dying breath to make this promise a reality for you. So let's look at it just for a moment. Zoom back out again. Rivers of living water flowing to serve millions and millions of thirsty sinners and sufferers as we receive from him first. The Holy Spirit will lead us. And the Holy Spirit will lead us into this. So we'll talk this morning about, about how this looks. And so to talk about the Holy Spirit, let's go back for just a moment to go forward. When we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about uh, part of the Godhead. God has existed eternally, Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, here's a nice summary of the Holy Spirit's uh, behavior from the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, fully divine. He inspired holy men of old to write the Scriptures. Through illumination, he enables men to understand the truth. He exalts Christ. He convicts men of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He calls men to the Savior and affects regeneration. At the moment of regeneration, he baptizes every believer into the body of Christ. He cultivates Christian character, comforts believers, bestows the spiritual gifts by which they serve God through his church. He seals the believer unto the day of final redemption. His presence in the Christian is the guarantee that God will bring the believer into the fullness of the stature of Christ. He enlightens and empowers the believer and the church in worship, evangelism, and service. This is the Holy Spirit. And when we trust Christ at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit of God dwells within us, speaking to us, bringing life in us, transforming us, and that Holy Spirit will lead us into rivers of living water. So this is how the Spirit leads. Let me give you, give me two things this morning. The Spirit leads us, the Spirit will lead us, I think I, that's a subject verb agreement, I think I had a will in there, the Spirit leads us <laughs> into ultimate satisfaction, and he will lead us out as servants. So kind of two parts there, he leads us into ultimate satisfaction, he will lead us out as servants. So we're told here in this passage, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus cried out. It means that Jesus, on a very busy, noisy day, loved us enough to shout something to cut through the noise. And here we have Jesus at this feast, this Jewish feast, the Feast of Tabernacles or of Booths, however you want to say that. And each day of the feast, there was always this elaborate water ceremony that took place. And so there, you'd see each day of the feast, a procession of priests. They would collect water, which flowed into the pool of Siloam. The priest would fill a golden pitcher they would be followed along with the choir. The choir would chant uh, lots of things, but Isaiah 12, 3, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And the water would be carried back up the hill, followed by a crowd of people who were carrying branches and singing the hallelujah psalms. That procession would, would arrive at the temple. The priest would climb the altar of the step and pour the water onto the altar while the crowd circled him and continued singing. And on the seventh day of the festival, this procession didn't happen just once. It happened seven times. And they would circle the altar seven times on the last day. And the water would be mixed with wine and poured out. This was a great big deal if you were a Jew to see this even one time. You think about this. What is this collecting water and processions and singing hallelujah psalms and pouring it out on the altar? What is this all about? Like, we kind of don't relate to that very well, do we? Well, first it was worship. They remembered through this pouring of water, they remembered the mighty works of God who led them out of Egypt, how he provided water from a rock in the desert. So they would sing hallelujah. It's also, this procession, this act was also an acted out prayer to God. Think, think about the time. They, there was this timely need for abundant water. It was a plea to God for more rain. In fact, all of them at this time in this place would be threatened by drought. And so they're praying for rain and fertility and fruit and life. So it's an acted out prayer they do all this. But also it's a ceremony of longing. As a drought-stricken land would pray for water, so drought-stricken humanity would pray for a day for the Spirit to come. And the Spirit to do things like what was promised in Ezekiel 47 promise in Ezekiel 47 is that, that one day out of God's temple, rivers of living water would flow 
in all directions, filling the earth with his abundance and with his life. That is, filling the earth with his spirit, his personal, life-giving, satisfying presence. So it's worship, it's prayer, and built into this whole process is longing. And so the songs are sung, the water's being poured, they're longing, they're longing, they're longing for the blessing of the Spirit. And then Jesus has the audacity to stand up at that moment on that day and say, come to me. The ceremony cries out for rain, and Jesus says, I have something your souls need more than the barren land needs water. I have something your souls need more than your physical body needs water. Come and find satisfying drink. Come thirsty. What do we thirst for? Are you thirsty? And we might say that, you know, in our best moments, in our most beautiful moments, when we've done, you know, real soul-searching work, we thirst for holy things, right? Like the psalmist who says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. But those are on our best moments. That we can name those things. But Jesus doesn't require us to have a sophisticated palate for our thirst here. He just says, come thirsty. So in our best moments, we might say, I'm thirsty for purpose or for peace or for love or for beauty or for hope. But really, mostly, my thirsts are very ordinary and often very petty and often very frustrated, right? What are you thirsty for? Maybe it's recognition. Would someone just recognize? holy desert, but you thirst. Or maybe it's success. Would something go right? Can't anything go right? Wouldn't it be great if everything would go right? Just so that I can rest, just so I can lay my head down today with every, without every wrong and every insecurity floating around. Just give me success. Or maybe it's power. You're sick of things happening to you I want to get things done instead, right? No longer happening to me. I'll be the doer. We, we thirst for power. Well, what about love? Just for someone to see you. Just for someone to stay with you. And we think about these things. So several chapters before this, like these don't sound mm, super holy, right on, right on the, just right at first glance, right? A couple chapters ahead, Jesus met with this lady at a well, a Samaritan lady. And that passage, in that passage, she is so spiritually obtuse. She's kind of clueless. Jesus talks to her about, you know, I'll, I'll give you living water and you'll never thirst again. And she keeps looping back around and says, you know what? Let's go find that water. That's pretty tasty sounding, right? Like she doesn't get it at all. She's not having a holy moment until the very end. Jesus says to us, bring all those thirsts, bring all your thirst. Listen, our thirst for recognition and success and power and love, they aren't nothing. But you understand that those things are pointers, they're not fulfillment. They're pointers, they're not ultimate things. So Jesus says, don't ignore them, and definitely don't take them somewhere else either. Those, if you get this in and of itself, those satisfactions will have a shelf life. Those are not an ever-replenishing spring, but bring them to me if you thirst. And I will give you an ultimate satisfaction that will never perish, spoil, or fail. Think about this. Jesus offers an answer for recognition and success. If you seek those things above all, eventually those things will undo you. Your failures will completely end that process. It's bound to happen. So will your work and success and social acceptance save you? Of course not. These are all good things. But whenever you fail at these things, they will fail you. Tim Keller has a wonderful quote about finding satisfaction in Jesus. He says, Jesus is the only Savior in the world who, if you gain him, will satisfy you. And if you fail him, he will forgive you. 
We thirst for power. So this world won't cripple me. So maybe in this, maybe this life you can get your power, maybe you can beat everyone, but you know what you cannot beat? The future. Sickness and death. What, what kingdoms in this world do we sing about right now that came to no end? Like, do you, like, do you sing songs of the Roman Empire anymore? No. British Empire? Mm, not really. The sun sets on every kingdom and every empire. But in Jesus, with Jesus, he'll flood your life with purpose and direction. He'll give you the freedom to do it as a servant. He'll give you peace even when you're on the bottom. He'll give you hope, which means that your life will last even beyond death. What about love? What greater love out there is there than Jesus? We're told that Jesus cherishes us like a husband cherishes a bride. Listen, we have no market value to Jesus. He's not weighing us on the scales of our usefulness for his own grandiosity. He gave his life to rescue his beloved, to make you clean, and to fill you. Now, if that's where the Spirit will lead us, though he'll lead us into ultimate satisfaction in Christ, there's a promise here that as he fills you in this way, what God does in every believer, he wants to do for all. So if you've experienced that, if you're experiencing that, what he's done for you, he then wants to flip that and to go through you so that all might experience that. And we call that move from experiencing it to then giving it, we call it mission. And what we understand that if we know that Christ is the one who satisfies us, we understand that when we go out on mission, we are not, we are not God's gift to the world. Let's undo that thought. God is the ultimate. We, our role, are to be, is, our role is to be pointers to Jesus. So our lives are what are called pointers to another, which means that we're able to lay down our lives for others just so that God's blessing might flow through you to someone else. So there's really a note here when Jesus says, come to me who thirst, and then I will, rivers of living water will flow out of you. There's actually a, an issue here, and I, we would call it something like this, like flow through ability, right? That's what we are. We're servants with flow through ability. No clogs. Let's not clog it up with ourselves. We're servants. This is our posture. This is our place. Listen, if you, if you have Christ, you make decisions in your life based on satisfaction, based from satisfaction. I, I think I, I, what I'm getting at is this, is that when you find your ultimate satisfaction in Christ, you are finally free to be a servant because you don't have to siphon stuff off of anybody else. You don't have to grasp. You're finally able to give. He leads us into ultimate satisfaction. He leads us out as servants. Not taking, not grasping, nothing to prove, giving. Secondly, and finally, this is, the Spirit will lead us with surprising, powerful currents of grace. The Spirit will lead us with surprising, powerful currents of grace, and he will lead us out in grace. Isaiah 58, 11 spoke ahead of time about this day that Jesus promised. The Lord will always lead you, satisfying you in a parched land and strengthen your bones. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose water never runs dry. I think that's such a surprising promise. Aren't you surprised by that? Maybe as you sit here today, that promise hits you kind of odd, right? That in your deepest parts, your heart, you, we, will be like a well-watered garden. There's this beautiful moment in Galatians chapter 5. 
where we're taught about how the Holy Spirit will lead us. And if you read Galatians chapter 5, you, you, you may think, well, that doesn't sound, you know, super mystical or, or very spiritually showy. Doesn't the Spirit just lead us into really things that get attention? No. In fact, Galatians chapter 5 says that when we were led by the Spirit, the Spirit produces inside of us a set of qualities, a set of qualities in Christians that don't grow naturally, but they do grow naturally in the Spirit. We've been talking about these things for several weeks with our children during the children's sermon time. Evidence of the Spirit leading you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. None of those things get the press. But that is evidence of the Spirit working in you. It is an outgrowth of finding ultimate satisfaction in Jesus. It is a supernatural miracle going on inside each one of us as we're led by him. And we know that this work of the Spirit is so surprising because fruit, if you think about the, the phrase fruit, like Jesus didn't say, here's the mechanics of the Spirit, here's the assembly line of the Spirit, he said, here's the fruit of the Spirit. It's very bota botanical, not mechanical. It's gradual and at times, at times surprising even in us. The outcome of our life becoming a well-watered garden. If you think, if you're like a gardener out there, here's what I know about gardens, virtually nothing, but here's, here's what I've observed, okay? So if you're a gardener, you plant a seed, and then what? Well, from the naked eye, nothing, 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 nothing. Then there's a sprout. And then what? Well, again, you see the sprout. From the naked eye, it's nothing, 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 nothing. And then a bloom. That's interesting. I thought nothing was happening. No, it's surprising. Lots of things were happening. And there's a bloom. And then what happened? Well, nothing. And then nothing. And then nothing. And then nothing. And then what? A fruit. And then finally, then, you can begin to see some things grow. Christians, we're, we're saved by grace, which means it's a gift of God. It's not by works so that no man can boast. God doesn't have a type. God doesn't have a factory stamping out identical products by identical methods. We come to Christ with vast, from vastly different places, but we come under the same finished work, of, finished work of Christ. If we're saved by grace, it also means that we're transformed by grace. And we may think, how, how even now is the Holy Spirit working inside of you? He's working in the invisible, in the steady, with surprising fruitfulness. But it's not just surprising. There are also powerful currents taking place inside you as well. We think about rivers of living water flowing in us. Have you ever thought about Like, think about that. It's really what we're doing today. Just think about everything this could possibly mean. Rivers of living water flowing in you. So I'm not a geologist either. <laughs> but here's maybe what I've learned from the Internet. Something as wonderful as the Grand Canyon was formed by what? A river of water flowing through rock. Currents cutting through rock. What is this telling us? That the Holy Spirit's work in us will make deep cuts, deep inroads and tributaries into our hearts. Listen, if we believe that the Spirit of God lives in us, we also need to believe that, there, that he is ever advancing light flowing water in us to address in us what is dominated by the dead, barren way of sinfulness. That river's flowing within us to challenge our allegiances that we still give to dead, parched ways of living and being. The, whole, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is something like this. That way is dead. Lay it down. And as he, as he does this in our lives, this, this should be met from us by, with glad repentance. Because he loved us and he laid down his life for us. So every move God makes in our hearts, even if it's cutting new paths, is a move of grace. And if he's doing this by his sheer grace, it means that, and if we come simply to him by faith, it means that nothing that he asks of us, we can say no to. If we're saved by our moral effort, you know what we can do to God? Now, you ever think about this? If you're actually saved by your goodness, you can say to God, you know what? Let me pace this one out, okay? I'm going to take off Tuesday. Maybe I'll catch up Wednesday on the sanctification thing. 
But if you're saved and transformed by grace, there is nothing he cannot ask of you. And there is nothing which you will not gladly respond to in faith and repentance and just saying, yes, Lord, let's go. Rivers of living water flowing in, flowing through, flowing out to serve millions and millions of thirsty sinners and sufferers as we receive from him first. And here's, here's where we end today. That this, this idea that as we've received from him, so we send it out. There's this place in scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper. I want you to think with me here just for a moment. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. And he says something like this. I, I say it about once a month. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. And then he goes on to describe the Lord's Supper narrative that Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and he took a cup. So he says, for what I received from the Lord, I passed on to you. And I think that that phrase is a great summary of Christian ministry. What I received from the Lord, I passed on to you. But if you look closely at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is not just talking about the mechanics and the process of doing the Lord's Supper and how it, how it ought to go. If you broaden the scope and look a little bit at the passage, Paul is not just giving a liturgy for the Lord's Supper. Actually, if you look a little bit closer, he, in the middle of this, he's saying this in the middle of a whole argument where he's saying, look, listen, I hear reports among you that you're using economic status and spiritual status to treat each other like crap. That's Marshall's translation. And it's showing up in how you practice the Lord's Supper. That at the Lord's table, people are being treated as lesser. It's an opportunity to humiliate, to demean, and to even hurt people. And Paul says this, I want you to reflect upon the table of the Lord, the body and the blood. He's saying to the Corinthians, all you know are the deep currents of God's grace. That's all you know. That's all you have. What you have is based on the body and blood of Christ. And that's all you can possibly pass on to one another. There's a phrase out there that I wish did not exist. And the phrase is church hurt. You ever heard it? People talk a lot now about church hurt. It's why people aren't in churches anymore. It's referencing the pain and sadness and emotional scarring or abuse experienced in the church context. Church hurt can be inflicted intentionally or unintentionally by congregants or religious leaders. Church hurt. And listen, it's not always intentional, but I think it's very likely among people who are not careful about grace. Let me give you a pastoral vision in a nutshell, and we'll pray, and we'll sing. Pastoral vision is this. Church hurt, let's stop the flow. Instead, let's, let's commit ourselves to church help for sinners and sufferers. Let the waters flow to the thirsty. You know, we begin our service in a very particular way for a very particular reason. Because we were reminded from the very first breaths of when we gather for worship, like Paul with the Corinthians in the Lord's Supper, we're reminded of the only thing that we can pass along to one another. It's grace. Listen, we don't need your personal extra sauce on God's grace. That's what hurts people. What you've received from the Lord, that's what you pass on. Not passing on that plus your damaged ego. Not passing on that plus your vindictiveness. Not passing on that plus your self-righteousness. Not passing on that plus your theological high horse or plus your own demons. If you have received rest, comfort, strength, and a savior. Our mission is to pass it along. The Lord will lead us with powerful surprising currents of grace, and he will lead us out.
and grace. May it be so of us. Let's pray, and then we'll sing together. Father in heaven, we pray that we receive your word this morning like toddlers in a bathtub. Lord, help us to splash in the water of your satisfaction and your love. Help us to embrace all that you say to us with joy. Lord, as we're challenged, we don't leave it as a challenge. We then turn it and consider it all joy of how you've called us, how you're molding us, how you're sending us, Lord. We pray in all things to be your church, set aside for your purpose. Lord, in the moments ahead, whatever we might need to do or pray or think or change, Lord, lead us by your Holy Spirit as we sing. We pray this in your name. Amen. Stand with me as we sing. Well, as we close out our time in worship together, uh, let's, do a, let's do a couple things here together. Uh, the first is I want to introduce you to someone. Uh, Danny, come on up. This is Danny Paez, and she comes forward this morning. Uh, she's been worshiping with us for a couple weeks now. 
as she comes forward this morning uh, for a couple things, to seek membership in this local church, but she comes by statement of faith, a longtime believer, uh, but also with the, with the desire to pursue a believer's baptism. And so would you affirm uh, Danny's desire to be a part of this church family, to serve and to be served, uh, to love and to be loved? Would you affirm that by saying amen? I'm going to let you have a seat for just a moment, and she'll be here right after the service. Please come by and extend uh, a warm uh, hand of, of love and welcome to her this morning. Uh, a couple of things uh, in the bulletin I just need to point out to bring to the surface. Uh, obviously, this is Thanksgiving week. Uh, please find an opportunity uh, to find some rest this week, uh, to find some refreshment uh, with family if you're doing that and celebrating this holiday. Uh, there aren't any activities on Wednesday night this week, and Golden Circle is not meeting this week either. Uh, you'll see there's some opportunities uh, to serve and to give. Uh, this is actually a season of great generosity in our church. Uh, the first thing I want to point out to you are some things related to our Christmas angel tree. Uh, in the foyer, uh, you would have passed by a tree with angels hanging on it. Those angels represent children, uh, families in our community. Uh, who we commit each year to buy Christmas gifts for. And so uh, would you stop by that tree? Would you take an angel prayerfully or two or three or however many the Spirit leads you in and do that uh, and take that and provide for those, those families this Christmas? Uh, you'll notice also right next to the tree there's a little clipboard. If you take an angel, it's got a, a number and a letter on it. Would you just put your name there and let us know which one you have so that we know that something just didn't fall off the tree or something like that? Okay, so, uh, but also there are, there are food bags available as well. Part of this process, whenever we do the distribution day, is families are able to pick up gifts, but also able to pick up food boxes. So we do that for those families as well as for CASA within our community. And so you'll see also out there, if you pick up a paper sack, it's got a list of items to fill that paper sack with and then bring that back. All those things would be due back by December 3rd, and our distribution day is December 9th. And if you're able to serve in any other capacity, uh, for this program, uh, just talk with me and let me know. The only other thing I want to point out to you here is that we also have an upcoming basics class. It's a class of conversation. It's really for a new or prospective members of First Baptist Church learning about our mission and vision and who we are as a church. It's a great conversation for those who have been worshiping and you might want to explore joining First Baptist Church. And that's on December 3rd, right after morning worship uh, in the conference room, which is right behind me. And then you'll see looking ahead, we've got uh, Christmas will start early for us, December 3rd in the evening. Uh, we've got a, a praise night followed by our yearly church-wide Christmas party. Uh, and so something that's a great joy each and every year. And so I want you to be part of that. That's December 3rd, not 31st. That little line is the dividing line and not a one in there, okay? But I'll make it bigger this coming week so we can tell the difference. All right. If you would, stand with me. Uh, and then we'll go out as the Lord leads us. I believe printed on the screen there for us is our benediction. Would you speak and pray this benediction with us as the Lord sends us out this morning? May the beauty of God be reflected in our lives. The love of God be reflected in our hands. The wisdom of God be reflected in our words. And the knowledge of God flow from our hearts that all might see and seeing believe. Grace and peace.